At any one time on Earth, you are experiencing an atmospheric pressure of approximately 14 pounds for every square inch of surface area on your body. When a diver submerges, they experience more atmospheric pressure because water weighs more on them than air weighs on us at the surface. So for every 10 meters deeper they dive, they experience an additional atmosphere of pressure, also referred to as barometric pressure, or shortened to one bar, because it feels like a 14 pound, one inch wide bar is being pushed into your bum more and more the deeper you go. <laughs> Conversely, when you go into space, there is an absence of atmospheric pressure, and your body will experience the force of approximately negative 14 pounds per square inch, which is highly suspect because this one guy I met at a music festival said we're all made of space dust. So if people are made of 60% water and we don't feel the pressure when we're diving, but we're made of 100% space dust and we explode in space, then as far as I'm concerned, science has a lot of explaining to do. As you know, Starfield is a space game, and there are lengthy periods of time spent in the vacuum which will kill you if you're not wearing a spacesuit. So I've taken it upon myself to put my body of cosmic space dust to the test, and we'll be showing you how to finish the game without a spacesuit or without a helmet. And just in case that isn't enough, we'll also be finishing the game using only mines to do damage, and on very hard difficulty. Because as far as I'm concerned, this is the perfect build. We'll also not be using a companion unless they are quest locked. And if they are with us, we'll be asking them to wait somewhere far away from combat so that their contributions are as little as possible. Today we'll be playing as Fadenpuben, your disappointed uncle from the Bronx who has sighed 14 of your cousins. The very first thing I do is look for the sandwich everyone said I missed in the starting area in my last video and I can't find it. Why have you all deceived me like this? Lynn tells us to put on a helmet to leave the mine hab. And we cannot leave unless we do, so this is an instant fail. I hope you've all enjoyed the video. It was a long run, but we had to end somewhere. No, but we do have to put a helmet on and then instantly take it off to start the challenge. And our first hurdle is going to be to make it to the frontier without every orifice in our body exploding with shit, piss, and blood until we're dead. I had it in my mind that I would run to the spot to trigger the frontier landing, then run back to the mine hab, wait for Barrett to walk out of the ship and talk to Lynn, run to Barrett, quickly do the dialogue, then run back to the mine hab, etc etc but if you simply run into this wall here the game now thinks you're indoors and my bodily fluids are now safe within the big wet sack that is Farden Pooban's skin you see what's happening here is Bethesda have placed the crossover threshold for the indoors to this hab unit to be too far out from the door itself leaving the game to think that we are now indoors while being outdoors and allowing us to suck breathable air in from this door wirelessly into our lungs this effect persists so long as we are here and don't cross over any meaningful loading screens that might check or reset our breathability Wi-Fi connection we watch the miners farm minerals from the pirates because we don't have any mines just yet. Wrap up on Vectera by taking absolutely everything, which is very important for getting money for mines later. And Barrett stays behind, giving us the keys to the frontier with which we fly to Crete. Crete is an atmospheric moon that you can breathe on, so there's no issues here. Normally, I'd encourage you to simply drink an inhaler and jump to the roof of this place, teleporting all the NPCs with you to progress the quest. But then you'll be in the unenvious position of being a man without mines to fight three NPCs. So we simply sprint through the compound and run away from the pirates, much like Fard and Puban's dad ran away from him when he was a child. And because we can't ask Vasco to wait at the ship, he takes all the damage while we do so. The reason we run through this facility is because we're trying to find mines in all of these chests, and we'll need at least one to deal with the gang on the roof. But you know, it's also good to gauge the damage that these mines do. Whoa. Something's out there. My kill, my share. Ah! These pirates survived one blast and then Vasco finished them off, meaning we'll have to get creative when we get to the roof insofar as using our environment because the guy up there at the stage is like a miniboss. So once we get there, the pirates wait for us patiently while we sneak out, leap to the roof, sprint to the other side of the building, do a hit of amp, sprint and jump onto the building behind them, and simply find every environmental hazard we can and chuck them at the pirates until there's nothing left on the building. That's every flammable barrel, every radioactive barrel, and every barrel I know reacts to damage, but that might not necessarily damage the enemy when they explode. We'll then throw a single mine like a frisbee in this low gravity environment, start the dialogue, and as soon as the dialogue ends, they're flagged hostile and reduced to dust. Oh, this will be fun. Mission successful. We hit up Jemison and go on a massive stealing spree throughout the entire city. The best part being the UC surplus store in the well. This place is full of goodies one moment and completely empty the next. The shop owner can see you one moment and the next moment you're crouched behind a box. And in the few seconds it takes for him to stand up again, all of the things actually in his line of sight vanish before his very eyes. How did this happen, he wonders. Where did my stuff go, he wonders. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. We meet Sarah at the lodge. She is now locked as our companion until we finish the next main story quest. We speak to the military guy who really likes Sarah. 
We punch her in front of him. I admire the next gen graphics. I use photo mode to take photos of me admiring the next gen graphics. Everything about the game is extremely new and very well polished. God, I love it so much. We sell absolutely all of the stuff we've looted to the trade authority. Collect our riches and head to Mars. Now Mars doesn't have a breathable atmosphere for humans, but I figure I might be able to sprint to the city of Sidonia before I die of suffocation. Turns out I don't need to for, s for some reason. I'm able to breathe here without issue because I guess Fardin Puban has replaced his need to breathe with coffee and ravioli. We speak to the guy and follow our trail to the next artifact, to the space station. Use too many minds to blow up this one guy in the kitchen. Realize clearing this place is fruitless and use the lack of fruit as fuel to sprint through the dungeon, engaging with absolutely no one else. The coordinates we pick up lead us to this ship that we get down to a micro HP, board, and then start throwing mines and exploding everything inside, which in theory would make the ship explode in space too. But because it's made of space dust, it doesn't, just like that guy at that music festival told me. We take the artifact. A notebook is spinning around on the floor. Very, very cool. We return to the lodge and we're level 5. Now the problem with doing damage using only mines is our damage on very hard is quite mid. And the talent for doing more explosive damage is hidden behind the first tier. Meaning we have to spend 5 skill points to be able to get 1 skill point in explosive damage. And all of these 5 skill points are going to be completely irrelevant for now. Anyways, Fadim Puban immediately ejects Sarah from his girthy party once she is no longer a mandatory companion. So that we can quest solo for real free on Cap No God. We speak with Adam Jensen. I never asked for this. He says he'll meet us in Aquila City where the next leg of the main quest is, which is where we'll be leaving him for several days and several nights because the next thing we're going to do is get a job at Ryujin Industries to unlock some pretty cool abilities to help us with our mine laying experience. How many years of experience do you have? Existence is pain, life is work, I simply live. How familiar are you with Ryujin Industries and its product lines? Yes. What is your proficiency in regards to typing and file management? Yes. What level of education have you completed? Carpentry. Do you have a history of criminal activity? Domestic violence. <laughs> I rob the entire city. Purchased the perfect outfit for my job interview at Ryujin Industries. Chill out at the club. Take multiple pictures of Fadenpoob and chilling out at the club. And ace the job interview by simply sitting in front of this woman in my spandex mankini and looking at her disappointingly. My first job is to get her coffee and the disgruntled ex-employee I have replaced is upset that a literal buffoon who looks like a psychedelic sack of milk has taken his job. But when I hide my bulbous planetary body behind this skinny bollard, he gets fully stunned locked with unlimited brain farts. It's not until the police get involved that he bothers to move forward, ending his life on the mine we left on the floor. I went to sit down on this table and go AFK, but then I forgot about the other mine I'd left behind. And the bar lady steps on that as well, resulting in a weird fade to black teleportation and some next gen physics related obscurity. The first few missions for Ryujin Industries are absolutely mind numbing because they're all in breathable atmospheres, require no killing and no skill, just hacking single computers or picking up one item. It's obvious that Bethesda thinks only blind deaf babies with soiled nappies play their games. So we blast through these with absolutely no effort whatsoever. The most important part of the early Ryujin quest is to do the thing this guy wants you to do. Fly up to the spaceship, speak with this woman, talk with her in a calm and measured manner, and make a deal with her so that she can part from your company peacefully. You will then steal her ship, the Datura, because it's the best ship in the entire game. And I'll explain more about this later. For now, we're informed that someone within Ryujin Industries is leaking company secrets to vastly inferior companies like Apple. So when we're promoted to special corporate operatives specializing in stealth and espionage, and the higher-ups send us to infiltrate our own workplace to find the mole in the company, being spotted is absolutely not an option. So we scale some buildings at night, enter the workplace through a back door the employees use to sneak in when they're just a couple minutes late, just like in real life. Huff on our laced inhaler and spray Sprint at the speed of sound through the Ryujin HQ. This is one of the most ridiculous things I have ever experienced in the video game, and I'm 100% for it. After all, why shouldn't a 300 pound man from the Bronx in stretchy pants be able to sprint undetected through a heavily patrolled and fortified megacorp tower, coffee sloshing around in his belly and all? The majority of these quests play out the same way. The best way. Using the evidence, we suspect our boss is the mole, so we stealthily track her through some crime syndicate HQ, where I find her and try to extract the truth from her using our tactful approach. <laughs> but no luck. Fortunately, there's a persuasion option whereby we can take the information and let her go. Turns out the real mole is her boss. I go to her office to negotiate the terms of her surrender. Alas, I'm not so good with words. You can't be serious. You can't be serious. You can't be serious. You can't be serious. You can't be 
be seen. This woman is an absolute monster, so when I've finished killing myself in this endless suicide death loop I have constructed with explosives and stupidity, I finally manage to get the jump on her, but she survives the literal 80 mines I place behind her. I get through the segment by hiding behind her bulletproof office implements and chucking inferno mines at her until she resigns. I'm starting to think that this is what the rest of the playthrough is going to be, with the enemies being demigods highly resistant to explosive damage. What the hell have you done? Is Ularu alright? and groan in despair. We head to the Bessel system, where we'll be investigating the companies besides Apple that have our company secrets, and watch on and awe as Adam Jensen's child, who was aboard our ship all of a sudden, is completely invulnerable and somehow hostile to the onboard turrets. Sometimes kids gonna kid, you know. The base we're investigating is on a moon with no atmosphere, so we'll be testing our skills moving forward. We pop an amp and sprint through the base. Sadly, the habs are not atmospheric, lacking all semblance of taste and decor, and render us still unable to breathe. I hit up the elevator but it appears we lack the keycard. Fadenpuben accepts his fate. We look for the keycard. I think maybe it's in here? But, but nah. We're also in combat, and our Italian espresso is not enough to prevent the shit, piss, and blood from exploding from every orifice. We are dead again. But you know, we use the time between explosive decompressions to look around. It's part of the challenge, you see. Perhaps one of the smarter things I have ever done was use this time of extreme agony to slam this button and have the quest marker actually update me as to where the keycard is. Turns out it's just around the corner, very cool. I make my way down into the subterranean underground, where there appears to be atmospheric pressure, so that's good. Our brains aren't going to explode out of our eye sockets in a fine red mist anymore. Sadly, the guards that saw me physically spawn on top of me and our most successful run to date is at an end. But there's much more pasta to come, because I'm feeling saucy. I know what to do now. We rush the key, rush the elevator, go down the elevator and immediately evade the guards who come down here by hiding behind some crates, allow our health to recover by sucking all of our bodily fluids back inside. Pop some mad pingers and ignore every obstacle down here, because by this point my strategy is so well cooked it's not even al dente anymore. At the end of the cave is an elevator, but we're back into no atmosphere. Because our body is exploding life everywhere, there's lots of space inside now, which we'll fill with these emails we pretend to read. Sadly, however, reading the emails isn't our only goal here, so we blast towards our ship, have a nap to re-health our innards gooda, and awaken to the gunfire of the turrets firing at that weird child on our ship. Now what this pirate has on him is some information about the company that has stolen our IP which can be pickpocketed, but I simply can't get close enough to him without being spotted. Because Todd programmed the vacuum of space to have sound waves, and he can hear our footsteps. I'd simply kill this guy, but as you can see, I have three measly mines left and can't bring myself to spend another hour going from shop to shop to buy the 30 extra required to actually kill him. So I come up with a huge brain move. You see, if I simply use non-lethal weapons, this will not be breaking the rule because we're technically not doing damage. This allows me to knock him out, allowing me to calmly walk up to him, retrieve the item, and get back into our ship before I perish. I try again. It works. Turns out some big pharma company has stolen our secrets and I steal the keycard from the guard, walk into their employee only section and they all just accept that this huge man in spandex works there. I access this man's PC by simply using it while he is sitting in front of it. I like to think my arms wrap around him lovingly like so, and take our precious stolen shipment from him, which is plainly out on display because he just walks out of the room. Just simply marvelous writing. You can't, you can't write a better questline. While Ryujin works over the evidence, we're sent on a side job for the mayor of Neon or whatever. All because of that one time in the earlier Ryujin missions where I killed a guy using explosives. What's, what's his problem? He wants me to hit a target on the moon of Titan, which as you may or may not know, hasn't got a breathable atmosphere. Ordinarily, our hopes of getting all the way to the sky, dropping mines and making them stand on them before we suffocate would be unrealistic. However, if you simply go into this cab unit right here, and then fast travel back to your ship, and then go outside again, you will see that you can now breathe without issue. This is because Bethesda programmed the game to be confused about when you can breathe and not breathe depending on where you fast travel to and from under certain conditions. This only works on habs with airlocks that do not have loading screens because the loading screens are what performs these breathability checks between different zones. Meaning in this instance we can take our time and leisurely kill off our target stress free. This is also a strategy we'll be using for later. We return to Ryujin where we get a special microchip planted into our brain. A fart improvement takes us very well considering he only thought he was coming into the clinic to get his nails done. No, but for real, this chip allows us to mind control people to move places and perform certain tasks. This is exactly the thing we have run through the Ryujin quest line for, and exactly the thing we want in order to safeguard our journey through the main story quest. At this point, we can choose to abandon this set of quests and continue the main story, effectively stealing Ryujin tech and not finishing their quest line, were it not for the fact that the last quest is very spicy. You see, the Ryujin higher-ups want us to sabotage the company that stole our secrets and try to develop their own version of our tech by infiltrating 
infiltrating their workplace and installing Skyrim on all of their computers, bugging up their system and rendering their entire operation non-functional. And they want us to do this silently and stealthily, so as to not lead the trail back to them. Welcome to Infinity LTD's corporate headquarters. Obviously, we have other ideas, because we'll be using this as practice for the main story quests to come. I'm going to find this hard that you're here. With the Ryujin Industries questline finished and our newfound power of manipulation acquired, we are now able to continue our journey. We head to Vectera to pick up Barrett. That one guy gave us the keys to a ship which we should have returned to him months ago, but didn't because we had a job at Ryujin Industries. It turns out he's been taken by pirates and is up for ransom. Lin tells us she's tried to find out where Barrett is, but she can't decrypt the tracking information she got from the tracker she herself put on the pirate ship. This is because she's an idiot. Anyway, I figure I can walk into the hab where the computer is to see if there's an atmosphere I can breathe in, but it turns out there's not. So instead, we blast through the dialogue with Lin and stand against the magical wall of breathing we stood again right at the beginning of our challenge and now breathing is no object. We find out Barrett's location by reading the tracking data, which has been converted into a text email by turning the computer on. Something Lin didn't do. This is because she's an idiot. We tell Lin we're going to find Barrett and she wants to come with us, but we don't want her to come with us. This is because she's an idiot. <laughs> Now there's something to be said about the specific bugged ship we're flying. The Datura has this weird glitch where after some time, it will simply fly away from you completely unprompted. You can also fast travel to it through your environmental scanner while it's flying away from you, and you'll be transported to it and locked into its orbital trajectory into space, which is normally a loading screen. A lot of people keep telling me this is because Bethesda aren't as good at making polished games like Baldur's Gate 3 or Cyberpunk 2077. But if I'm being totally honest, my experience has been about the same. And by about the same, I mean everyone's opinion's wrong. All games are bugged, and we're all going to be wiped out by aliens, nuclear war, or a doomsday meteor before a bug-free game will ever be launched. Anyway, I bring up the Datora because we land on the moon with the very last location of Barrett. The quest marker is one and a half kilometers from our ship's landing zone, which is simply an impossible distance to run without a spacesuit. Unless, of course, you're doing something like building an atmospheric outpost every few hundred meters, something that would be very easy for an accomplished carpenter such as Uncle Fadenpuben. But before I could come up with a strategy for making this distance, I noticed my ship fly off. <laughs> Was it something I said? So I fast traveled to it, and something extraordinary happened. This is why I called the Datura the best ship in the game. Now, I'm not a rocket surgeon, I'm not 100% sure of the specifics behind this, but I think the Datura, on its predetermined bugged flight back into orbit from the ground, flew over the mission area, enabling me to fast travel to it directly the next time I landed on the planet. This is something that's normally only possible if you've discovered the landmark before, and you can only discover a landmark if you've been there. So for now, the spectacular Datura and its stellar Bethesda coding is going to get credit for this. And if any of you disagree, this this image of disappointed Fadenpuben is literally Fadenpuben being disappointed in you, specifically. Please comment. Pl no, Uncle Fadenpuben, don't be disappointed. I... It was the Datura, okay? I understand now. We do our best to speak to Hella without letting the explosive decompression get to us on an emotional level. We get onto our bugged ship, which takes off in spectacular fashion, completely liquefying all the fear I had moving forward, and also solving every issue I had in my real life on a personal level. And we head to where Barrett is being held, a camp a trivial 100 meters or so from the landing zone. This makes running through decompression completely fine, you know, and anyone could do this, even, even I could do this. Send me to space, NASA, I'll prove it. Being the charming man that he is, he uses his gay riz to entrance all of the pirates who are now his besties. All we have to do is navigate some dialogue and we can free Barrett violence free. The next artifact is in Aquila City, and our only lead is a map possessed by Sam Coe's dad, who also happens to hate him, but whom we fortunately don't have to interact with because the map is in the bank vault. However, we're informed that there's a hostage situation at the bank. This is very inconvenient, so we convince the marshal that I, a multicolor sack of mashed potatoes, am the right man for the job, the right man to defuse the situation. 
Because this is just wasting my time, I deliberately botch the negotiation so that I can get the green light to infiltrate the bank through the unguarded back entrance and use our powers of manipulation to have this young man stand of the mines we've left behind. You see, the moment he gets flagged as hostile, he'll trigger the bombs because they've been coded to be aware of the intricate details of our interpersonal relationships. <laughs> I get it right eventually with the careful planting of our minds and it becomes clearer than ever that I am a gaming prodigy and cannot be contained. The bank vault contains a note from Samco's dad telling him GG's, so as it turns out we do have to interact with him after all. I have some strategies in place to get the maps with minimal effort. You're not getting those maps. Full stop. I guess it was nice talking with you. Love of God, stop! But as it turns out, Jacob Co. has daddy strength and cannot be stopped. So we break in, steal the map, sprint in a straight line for way too long to the cave a whole 600 meters away, which Bethesda for some reason thought we'd need a map to get to. We ignore all of the guards, and they're powerless to watch me waddle by, and wait patiently for me to lockpick the gate and entrance deeper in the cave. I find the artifact, I microwave it, and eat it. Oh no, we're surrounded! Kill them! Anyway, I ignore the ambush and run to our ship. There are no consequences whatsoever, job done. Next up, we're sent to a planet without a breathable atmosphere to find the last member of our ragtag team. Andresia, who has been out on field duty for a very long time and we're told is quite unhinged. The quest marker is fortunately really close to the landing zone, so we sprint over there without issue. We find Andresia in this cave, which has a breathable atmosphere without rhyme or reason. And it seems like Andresia is a totally mentally stable individual who is a great asset to the cause. She just doesn't stop shooting this corpse. Don't come any closer. Identify yourself. My name is Farden Poobin. I'm not here to hurt you. If it isn't clear by now that I enjoy photo mode too much, I, I should show you my photo album. <laughs> I'm sent to another world. It has an atmosphere, so no problem. It might be minus 10 degrees Celsius, but this body was made for survival. Millions of years of evolutionary perfection have come to this. I take some photos of our boy, completely unimpressed by the cosmological marvels before him. I absorb the powers of the temple, and now we have starborn powers that we're probably not going to use because they're not relevant to the challenge. I return the artifacts to Constellation. I want you for a little soiree, I and Walter Stroud tells me he wants me for a sauté out in Neon somewhere, where he has set up a deal to find another artifact. But if there's anything I learned on my last few expeditions, it's that I've used way too many mines to kill single enemies. And that's because I haven't unlocked all of the explosive skills just yet in the perks menu. This would require getting kills with explosive weapons on enemies. Of course, the easiest way for us to do this is probably to get a grenade launcher and clear pirate outposts. But I can't do that because this run is using only mines to get kills. And with farming pirates, this is going to take way too long. So I had a good think. I roasted that little peanut between my ears. And that's when it came to me. It doesn't have to be pirates, right? If I simply am not seen, I can have my way with the citizens. The citizens anywhere in the world. And these would surely count towards kills required for explosive skills, right? All that I had to do now was to find a spot where I'd be able to wipe out the most citizens at once using as few mines as possible. But where would that be? Probably the slums, I thought. This place looks like a lot of innocent citizens all clumped up. Very good, it just works. Up this tree? That's pretty good too. But I'm not 100% sure about the risk of getting caught. I eventually settle on the spaceport because it's a good vantage point, plenty of foot traffic with loads of people to terrorize, and no one can seem to figure out where all these landmines keep falling from the sky. Or how they keep falling from the sky. 
Sadly, I eventually run out of people, so I take the training montage to Neon's Astral Lounge, where there are plenty of people clumped up in close proximity. Place some mines on this table, manipulate someone to stand by them, hide upstairs, and let it all happen. I peel the skin from these dancers, and now I have completed my getup. I do another round of the airport stomping grounds after the place is repopulated, and my job is now done. Feeling suitably prepared for the quest to come, I continue to Neon, where I meet with Walter Stroud, where if you recall, he wanted to meet me for that swiri. He has set up a meeting with a seller looking to offload another one of those artifacts we've been collecting. The meetup happens to be in a nightclub that we use to level all of my explosive skills. All the corpses are still on the floor, and the NPCs appear to recognize the harbinger of their demise and flee in terror. So here's the thing about this quest. It really happens in three steps. I'm throwing these mines on the floor in preparation for the second stage. The first step is when you speak to the seller in the club, who will then want to meet you in the private room upstairs. Step two is we hop into the elevator going up, and we know the exact moment that Bethesda programmed him to spawn in the room we prepped with the massive explosion we hear. No one suspects a thing. We then walk past the room the corpse and blast marks are in, and plant some mines in the nearby hallway. We do this because step three is when we take the artifact from this briefcase, Bethesda spawns a hitman to deal with us who instantly explodes. Sending on men to the Astral Lounge. Slayton must be serious about you. These are Farden Boobin's three steps to success. Walter's wife is in Duck Club, ignores all of the corpses everywhere by looking at the ceiling. But she warns us that we have a bounty and our ship has been impounded until we give over the artifact to some other scrote here in the city. Disregarding all the evidence in front of her, she concludes that we're innocent and we devise a plan to escape the planet with our artifact. We stealthily infiltrate our enemy's workplace by huffing amp fumes and sprinting through the locale. We find Nikolaus. We use him the Boombas. We kill Nikolaus. We're attacked by a mysterious ship claiming to be the Starborn, not wanting to let us get away with the artifacts. Walter, who is the owner of his own ship company, warns us that the power of this ship in front of us is off the charts, and that we stand no chance. Anyway, we completely obliterate it with the Datura, the best ship ever. We hand the artifacts in and continue to the next artifact site. It's another moon with no atmosphere. We have to run 400 meters over a mountain and unlock the location. Fast travel back to our ship and then rest up for our health. Now we simply have to fast travel to the location and we've skipped that 400 meters and mostly have full health. We sprint past all of the pirates in this facility into the cave, totally ignore the otherworldly cosmic entity in here and mine the artifact. We have a full-blown hallucination while the starborn assailant waits patiently. That's so polite of them. And then escape with massive dexterity. We leave the facility and fast travel back to our ship. The next artifact is on another moon without an atmosphere. This time our target is 460 meters away, which is just about on the cusp of not being doable without building a hab halfway to recover. However, we manage to unlock it by still being pretty far out from it, return to the ship to recover, and then fast travel back and sprint past the guards into the base. The base doesn't appear to have an airlock or atmosphere, but once we go through the underground, some atmosphere materializes from nothing, which allows us to sprint through relatively pain-free if you take away the firing squads in here. Oh my god! I get very lost in here. Not my favorite delve in the game, but in fairness, the guards don't really do anything when you've lost them once, so there's that. I get to the room, ignore the Starborn, who can't really hurt me on very hard difficulty anyway. Not entirely sure why, but here we are. I trip out on the artifact and battle through the facility to try and find my way out. But as you may or may not know, this is impossible because every room looks exactly the same and my brain is too smooth to remember where to go. And when I do manage to get out, I'm still flagged as in combat, so I have to re-enter and hope the guards don't find me. Fortunately for me, they pretend Farden Pubin is not here because of the massive fear they feel in his presence. His testosterone musk is what creates atmosphere in these strange places after all. I am told by the fellows at Constellation that their little ragtag group's whole satellite station, the Eye, is breaking down and needs to be repaired. So I dock in hopes of helping out. Andresia is helping by asking me to look at these boxes. Barrett helps me run AVG antivirus. Samco gets me to acknowledge the welder on the floor. And Sarah thinks she's a tradesperson, so she asks me to pass her some tools and actually breaks the station further. Oh boy, if anything goes terribly wrong with the AI, it'll be totally Sarah's fault, right? Our next job is to barter with an antique collector for his artifact. His whole crew is a dangerous bunch of pirates that he's hired, but they will not be hostile with us so long as we persuasion check our collector into giving us his prized possessions. But the time for talking is over. Ah! 
I take what I please. I'm supposed to face massive resistance on my way out, but the pirates are too far into their 16 hour goon sesh to put up any sort of fight. I can't imagine how dehydrated they are. I return to the lodge, place the artifact in the thingy, and Noel informs us that the eye is completely dark. Oh boy, things went terribly wrong with the eye. It's Sarah's fault, isn't it? Turns out the Starborn have made it aboard the eye and are attacking. But this isn't our concern. Farden Puban is an otherworldly being with precognition because he has played Starfield before and places minds on this spot right here while everyone is freaking out over the comms. Everyone goes to the front door expecting our enemy to walk in the front door and Walter walks directly to our minds. That's strange, wonder why he's doing that, haha, <laughs> wink. That's mad, bro, I can't believe you're here to fight us. Anyway, we escape the planet and gently dock with the eye to see if we can help our friends before it's too late. It's too late. I take a moment to grieve for the best girl with the best bum in the game. I take photos of me grieving for the best girl with the best bum in the game. I console the other members of Constellation as you do. Barrett's looking quite cold so he gets a blanket of Inferno Mines. He'd best not move until I get back. I go over the photo album and reminisce about the good times on the journey so far. And I'm resolved to push forward. Equipped with hundreds of mines. Without a spacesuit to protect me from the vacuum of space. With only the most supreme clenching to protect my innards from becoming outeds. Now the next part of this journey is about determining the final locations of the last artifacts. We go to find the leaders of some churches for their insight. Naturally, I pickpocket the priest. After some dialogue, we conclude where to go for our next lead. And the priest gives us some priestly robes of our own. Fard and Puban is now a full-blown priest. I pose very holy-like for the camera, immediately renounce my faith and start returning to multicolored spandex. Our next lead is on a planet with atmosphere, so no problems here. The notes we find there lead us to the Hyla system. We land on another breathable planet, and I pretend to understand this puzzle, accidentally solving it as I know all the rest of you did too. I take some photos of me pretending to understand the puzzle. The starborn guy who attacked the eye stops us and wants us to make a deal with him. So we board the ship. The person accompanying him, who isn't his companion, who is kind of his enemy, I, I don't know, it's, it's really weird, is actually Sarah from another universe. And of course, the moment we learn this, we reject all of the help and get off that ship ASAP, lest she is attempted to repair it and it will explode at any moment. But they do point us towards a base on Luna, our real life moon, which is really cool. Finally, a place where my bodily fluids are violently trying to escape and I can actually partake of the challenge. So we go into the base, read a NASA email about Project prism and we're told to go to the roof of the facility but here's something cool you should all know we fast travel from this base to our ship invoking the bug of space breathing and just stroll out to the roof of the space on the moon and we listen to an intercom as it transmits sound waves to our ears using a process called magic why did nasa put an intercom on the roof of, on a base on on the moon why why is this happening like who writes this shit anyway it leads us to the surface of the earth where we find nasa now you might notice that i'm breathing on this planet which which in the law no longer has an atmosphere and it's because of the airlock glitch we performed on the moon. Remember when we did this on Titan? Well, once we'd left the soul system, we run through a loading screen that rechecks whether or not you should be breathing and resets the glitch. But because we are only going from the moon to Earth and staying within this system, that check is not being performed and persists by the good graces of our Lord Todd. We scale the NASA. We enter the NASA. This whole facility has mostly no enemies, so it's really a bit of a cakewalk. I mean, we do encounter enemies at times, but we simply run past to bypass the security, just like you can probably do in real life. Why anyone hasn't tried this with the bank set is, is so weird. Imagine the we float through the NASA, learn that they used the artifact for something that accidentally destroyed the world, but slowly over many years, with, with ample forewarning, sure, but just like what's happening in real life now, we, they all ignored it. It's, it's so exciting. Imagine the possibilities. We grab the artifact, and I ignore the starborn assailant opting instead to simply run past them all to walk out the front door. We tell the hunter and the emissary that we will fight them. They don't like this, so they escape as quickly as possible, with great haste, afraid of the Fadenpuben. I'm told there will be a funeral service for Sarah, which I do not attend, of course, opting instead to go to the next artifact site, because we're still collecting artifacts. The ride never ends. This particular artifact is quite the ordeal, because it just might be one of the caves in the entire game that doesn't have an atmosphere. Our best attempt is when we go back to our ship to rest, fast travel to the cave, sprint to the bottom, grab the artifact, ignore the starborn warrior, resurface, and then try to fast travel to the ship again, but we're unable to. We're still flagged as being in combat. So we think of something else. Maybe we can re-break the breathing detection by returning to the moon, going into the airlock, fast traveling to the ship, launching into space, jumping to our destination system, by landing directly at the cave. Hey, I thought I understood the glitch, but I don't, I guess. Who knows? Fortunately, this place is the final location without an atmosphere. So that facet of the journey is complete. We now know that you can beat Starfield without a spacesuit. 
and without a helmet. But now we must continue and resolve the mine portion of the run. The final artifact is on this world, in this facility, where we're being ripped from one universe into another. One where the facility has been destroyed in a fire and overrun by creatures, and one where the fire has been contained and all as well. It might come across as insensitive, but we use our inferno minds to destroy the alien beings in the universe where everything has been burned to the ground, because they're creepy and must be purged. This trend continues through the linear passages of the dungeon until we get to such a point that we're capable of deliberately shifting through dimensions to solve puzzles. By virtue of our dad anger and transcendental disappointment, but also this device that we're given in the universe that hasn't been destroyed. But you know, that doesn't really matter that much. We, let, let, let's ignore that bit. The journey through this place can be summed up by this security bot punching me back into the other dimension while I'm trying to navigate my way through the whole thing. It's a tough time out there for those of us trying to save our minds. In the end, I grabbed the artifact, and now it's time for preparations moving forward. I need bigger guns on the ship, but they're locked behind some ridiculous progression that wants us to kill pirate ships. But here's a trick for you. Fortunately, if you trick the guy at the UC Navy Recruitment Office into thinking you're going to join them, you can then use their state-of-the-art flight simulator to destroy fake pirates that aren't real, and they for some reason count towards your kill count. We can then use our fake pirate skill point things and add bigger guns to the Datura. Now that the ship's fully upgraded, I travel the entire universe purchasing every mine imaginable, and head to the final location where we're ambushed by starborn ships. I must defeat the cosmic force beyond my understanding, beyond the reaches of my power. Anyway, that's why we got bigger guns, so we crush the starborn ships, it's quite easy. Land on the planet, it has atmosphere, so that's good, and the permafrost doesn't penetrate our astral lounge dance getup, so our body remains toasty. The very first boss of the gauntlet is this guy. He makes copies of himself. The most frightening being the copies that only use melee attacks, because they sprint towards me and make my job quite easy. I mean, I mean, they scare me a lot. The key to this fight is patience. Humility, breathing, controlling your heart rate, remaining calm. Or, hear me out, you could use your guile to simply be above your targets and drop mines on them from above. And if it gets too much, we vanish. Beneath the road, on a path where the Starborn can't go. Because he has the high ground, and Star Wars taught him that that's a win cheat code. But they don't know me, son. Who's gonna carry the boats? Who's gonna carry the logs? The reality is that this guy is so weak, it's making me feel weak. I'd learn that whenever I disengage, he, or rather this version of him, will walk up the very same set of stairs every time, upon which I leave him several gifts on the floor, with which he can remember the occasion that he met Fadenbuben. Decide he wants nothing to do with him, and stand stationary under a walkway, upon which he suspects Fadenbuben is on, and then come to the sudden realization that in infinite universes throughout the multiverse, every iteration of him is an idiot. I return to the Datura, which is no longer flying away from me for no reason, but you know, I'll take the I'll take the W. And I collect some of the mines that we have in reserve that we spent absolutely all of our money on, and continue on to the next leg of the boss gauntlet. This challenge is a funny one because the boss doesn't appear until you've managed to eliminate a number of the epileptic mercenaries. Our perks in the explosive tree have dramatically reduced the explosive damage we deal to ourselves, and at this point I begin to abuse this while we've still got plenty of medical supplies. This is because, as it turns out, very hard mode isn't very hard at all. We play frisbee with this guy, and our starborn assailant shows herself by means of very threatening threats that she threats at us. I'm absolutely besides myself with fear when I spot our target between a wall and some objects just stuck there. The strategy at this point is, you know, one that requires me to think as hard as possible. She eventually adjusts her strategy, as any unstoppable cosmic force does, and teleports away to take the powerful position of standing just at the base of this building upon which I'm standing. Her, her actions are beyond my understanding. I do a quick inventory check. 32 med packs. We're flying now, boys. I walk through some time sprinkles and I'm transported to a memory. A parallel timeline, maybe? At this point, I'm running purely on instincts, so... Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm... I'm sorry. We exit the fever dream into boss fight number three. It's very scary all the time because this time they have big robots and I get stuck behind this door.
Anyway, we revert back to our previous strategy because we have so many med packs, it's probably negligible at this point, right? Can you imagine how good Fart and Poop and skincare routine has to be for him to not have no face at any time after tanking these blasts? Guy must bathe in tomato sauce and exfoliate with coffee granules down at the Boston Fire Department. You just you just know it. We follow the scorch marks on the floor. This is Todd telling us that something big is coming up. And, sh and surely Todd wouldn't lie, right? We follow the scorch marks down to another out-of-body experience. But I've been here before. I've met this guy before. I know his weakness. His weakness has been laid bare before me. Spreading. Powerless. I lay the trap. I speak to the man. I anger the man. He springs the trap. He spreads for me no more, for he is gone. And I taste victory again, although that, that could be his blood mist. The scorch marks on the floor continue. The trail of destruction leads down this elevator in this mine. I cannot imagine the horrors that await me. I see visions of my own death, or perhaps the death of another version of me. I confront Vladimir. I tell him the artifacts aren't worth it, that we should all live in a lodge drinking coffee and eating ravioli together as friends. I contemplate the death of myself. I take some photos of me contemplating the death of myself, and we awaken back in the elevator. How long have we been asleep? Just how far down are we? There's a mountain of ammunition and supplies here. And you just know this doesn't happen unless we're about to experience the most ridiculous boss fight a game is to offer. I lay the mines and prepare my strategy. And there we are. The next boss fight. But something isn't right. You see, this Starborn makes copies of me. Normally these copies would kick the snot out of you using your own weapons and gear against you. But me? I don't have weapons or armor. So I just stand here. Watching them watching me. Knowing me knowing you. <laughs> we simply look at each other. Acknowledging each other's masculinity. They're just as masculine as I could ever possibly imagine. I take some photos of me contemplating how masculine they are. God, it's amazing. I manipulate one to stand on my minds, but then another version of me finds a gun somewhere and starts to shoot him, gives up and then runs away. I do not understand what's happening here. My actions are beyond my understanding. I fight the versions of myself that are brave enough to take on the original. I assail our cosmic assailant, but I forgot about the trap I laid. I try to fight, but this particular starborn guardian Fion is really a head scratcher. I dispatch more versions of me. This particular one tries to block with his fists the explosive fragmine he stands on. This guy is an absolute weapon, but the starborn remains. I lay the traps. final boss lies behind this door. The hunter who killed Sarah. The emissary who was cosplaying as Sarah. The grand finale of the whole story. Of our challenge. But I simply throw down my minds. Not in a way you'd expect, but in a show of solidarity. I have killed so much, they have killed so much. But maybe not the same as me. I, I didn't really kill them. I simply aided others in killing themselves by stepping on danger things. Anyway, now is the time for words. You're an idiot. Obviously it works, because I'd banked an auto-persuasion, without even fully knowing how it works. My actions are beyond <laughs> They take one look at Fadenpuben and they give up. His words, akin to smelling thousand-year-old coffee, makes them flee. And we take the final artifact. We return to the Datura. It still hasn't flown away from me, I see. It has unbugged itself in fear. We use all of the artifacts to construct the armillary, and fly to space where I encounter a bugged starborn ship. But no matter, the unity awaits. The ultimate goal. We fulfill our destiny. We are overwhelmed by a powerful waft of only the finest store shelf instant coffee. Some caffeine crystallizes within the forehead sweat beads on our face. And we meet with the ultimate version of ourselves. The first Fadenpuben. You made it. I hope you're enjoying the view. Thank you for watching. A big thank you to the patrons for supporting me in making these videos. If I were to ever have a metaphorical instant coffee, and were it to ever taste not bad, that would be you giving me a burst of energy to continue. For those of you who have enjoyed, please give this a thumbs up, and if you haven't commented, please comment literally anything. You could comment about how frogs are sick, man. What's your favorite Doritos flavor? Do you- Anyway, stay safe out there. Oh.